The Mazda CX-90, a new direction for this brand. In this video, you're gonna see an hour's worth of content from interviews with the designers, the engineers, to help explain the ideology behind what this vehicle is and where they're going in the future. Mazda had pushed the front wheel drive architecture to the absolute limits of trying to make it feel more upscale, and they hit a wall, and they had to create a rear wheel drive platform that was similar to something you see in luxury brands like BMW and Mercedes. But the CX-90 and its future iterations are all built in a price point where most of normal people could afford, starting around 40,000 and moving upward. So they're trying to bring a lot of that into this Japanese formula that they've been great at. And out of the five years of doing this, I've had more messages and, and emails from people asking where this video was and why it hasn't been released. And I'm gonna tell you right up front. This was a very, very difficult video for me to put together. Every time I went to go edit it, I just shelved it. And a lot of it was because there was a lot of content and a lot of it was because we went through two different press cars where Jack and I were left with questions of, is this normal? Is this right? Is this what they set out to do? And over the course of making this video, I've had to go through reshoots and all of that, which is not a good sign, but I'm going to do my best not to throw the brand under the bus. I want to be very objective about what it is and what it's not, the good and the bad, because when you create something like this new and there's so much energy and money put into it, I think they were in the right direction for a majority of this, but there's some things that they probably can improve and I wanna be fair to the viewers and I wanna be fair to them as a brand. So I feel like my hands are tied in a way of trying to, to, trying to assemble this video. But first, let's hear a little bit about what the CX-90 in this generation vehicle is. I am Mitsuru Akie, and I am the program manager, CX-90. I have worked for Mazda for about 34 years. And uh, originally, I was a um, body engineering en engineer. And then I was in South California to work for North American operation and to understand uh, our US target customers' uh, needs and the values. This is probably my last outcome, outcome of my master's career. <laughs> so I just wanted to realize the best product in the master's history. So I'm John Leverett, a launch strategy manager for Mazda. So planning the overarching product strategy um, before it reaches kind of the other departments. Well, we knew um, from CX-9 that some of the things that we needed to prioritize were space. Uh, you know, CX-9, as great of a product as it is, we know that it's a little small. Um, so when planning a new product, we knew that we wanted a larger size, um, but we also knew that we needed to keep the Mazda driving dynamics um, and keep the things that our customers love, um, that are kind of our brand identity items like performance, uh, ride and handling, things like that. So, uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna add more size, uh, how can we do that and keep those handling aspects? And that's kind of how we arrived at that rear wheel drive platform with an inline six engine. Yeah. So obviously, with a higher price comes expected content. Um, and not only did we, you know, want to add things like ventilated rear seats, which starts to become an expectation now, heated rear seats. Um, a panoramic sunroof, those things are expected. And then just some more luxury touch items like a power tilt and telescopic steering wheel. You know, it's the first time we've had that feature probably since like the millennia in, nine, in the 90s, you know? So uh, just some features like that that, that are uh, certainly elevate the product to kind of that luxury standard. One of the big things that Mazda has done great in this generation, starting with the Mazda 3 and the CX-30, and then of course the MX, is material choice. The interior design for the price point is really, really special. And the CX-90 attempts to do that 
on another level because they want to go and make this the flagship vehicle for their brand, despite it being a three row. So when you look at the center plane of the dash, the stitching, the material choice, depending on what trim level you get, and of course the interior color selection, there is a, a sense of clarity in their vision of making it very clean, Mazda-like, purposeful, and not making it cheesy. We see this with a lot of luxury brands where they will throw the kitchen sink at you in terms of odd material choices and screens and all this in it. It really winds up after you get, get over it, it's just a bunch of gimmicks where this feels more classically designed, more physical, more tangible. And the CX-90 does a really good job with it. I'll be honest, when you look at this for like 50, 60 grand, you know, and you look at some of the other commodity brands that are doing it, this, this definitely is, on, they're on the right path. Now, when you look at the entire style of this, you can see that it's just got a classic Mazda design, but it looks so long and so sleek. For an SUV, it definitely has a presence to it. The one misleading thing about it in terms of design is the door skins are enormous. When you look at the door panel on the outside, you're just like, why, this is so big. And you'd expect that door from top to bottom to, to mirror the interior, but no, the bottom half of the door is actually uh, mostly just a cover up for the door sill. So on the outside, it looks like the inside would be much bigger than it is, but the inside is definitely still large. As a three row SUV, you know, you want a lot of space. That's why you're buying this. The rear occupant room is excellent. And that's because they haven't screwed around with any type of electronics. The second row's captain's chairs move traditionally with a handle that you can slide forward and back. And there's a handle on the side to recline and the recline is at a good angle. So you can get really comfortable back there. With the way that they've given you the pass through walk place in the middle, it's easy to get in the third row. And the third row is adequately comfortable from what you expect in this class of vehicle. Again, the rear seats kind of mirror the front. They are on the firmer side again, but I think that overall the usability and space in the back is excellent. Now there is second row climate controls, which carry with a vent work towards the back, but there are only two vents for the second row, which are in the center, center console here in the back. So that's something to note. There is heated seats in the back if you opt for that, you know, the, the package that has that. So I think there's a good blend of features and usability in here overall. And with the seats up in the back, you can store plenty of things. But really the, the big thing is, is when you put those rear seats down and you put all the seats down, it's a massive space. In the back with the PHEV, of course, with the hybrid drivetrain and the battery pack, you get a 1500 watt power supply, which is great for all the pumps that I use uh, for my body and other tools that I use. So you have that extra power capacity if you're going out in the wild. The rest of the interior space a lot of this is traditional Mazda approach that we saw in the Mazda, the Mazda 3. It's the concept of not overburdening the driver with too many physical things in front of you, either touch or just physical controls. And that's the infotainment dial. There's only roughly five to seven buttons for everything. The shifter is very simplified. All the HVAC is physical. Most of all the control structure in this car is physical. The infotainment screen is operated by a rotary knob like iDrive used to be for BMW. It works great. It's very simple to use. And they've kind of pedaled back on the touchscreen aspect because you can use the touchscreen inside Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, which is really helpful for some features. Everything else here is traditional Mazda stuff. The fit and finish is pretty good overall. The material choice, depending on the trim level, you can get this alloy look, which has a black paint in it or a black accent that makes it look like it's laser etched, but it's not, it's, it looks very 3D. They know how to do interior material choice. And this is just a highlight of the best thing they can do for the dollar amount that you can spend. The interior usability is a mixed bag. And what I mean by that is they talk about the audio system, how they move the base driver from the door panel to the kick plate by the foot well to not only save space, but it's better for the audio system. But you would think that the door panel and just how large the doors are would have much more minivan-esque storage. And it's really small compared to some of their competitors. You have such a small door panel, you would think that the packaging would be better there. Uh, things like the center console are enormous. It is really well designed, but it's an enormous place with not a lot of storage and things like the wireless phone charger in the front, 
you're like, oh, okay, that's a convenient spot. Because of the rake that it's at, it's not angled downward enough where your phone, if you take a turn or you hit the brakes, it's so easy for your phone to fly out of this space and it's constantly moving off the wireless charger. There's things like this that don't make a lot of sense. And another thing is when you look at this armrest space, you would think this would be a chasm of storage and it's not. I think that's the big thing about this car that surprised me on the interior. When you get over some of the beauty and simplicity of design, the storage is not the greatest thing in the segment. You're gonna go through a lot of effort to create this brand new generation architecture where you can kind of scale it out to different vehicles. And some of that just starts with what they wanted to do with drivetrain and explaining the updated drivetrain choices in an era where everybody's moving to electrification or hybridization. Mazda has chosen to go with an inline six engine, something that we're not typically seeing. Everything's going turbocharged four cylinders with hybridization. So for them to make that move was largely because of driving dynamics, where they place the engine, where they place the transmission, their drivetrain calibration. And we had a chance to talk with Dave Coleman about that decision along with one of their drivetrain engineers. Hi, uh, my name is Jay Chen. I'm the uh, manager for powertrain performance at Mazda R&D North America. Basically, my team and I of uh, Japanese and American engineers, we basically work on the tuning aspects of you know making the powertrains that we get from Japan very unique and fit our North American driving environment. This is a big, big undertaking for, for the company. Um, we've been talking about our little secret since I've been with the company like seven years ago. So every time, you know, media asks us, you know, trying to dig out future product, we were secretly giggling to ourselves in the background. Like we knew this was coming, we were planning. So I would say seven, eight years, um, seriously on paper in the planning, uh, you know, developed and not developed, but you know, we were on this path and this is gonna happen. Um, and then the idea is really not just the powertrain, but you know, we decided we wanted to go rear drive because that's the ideal platform, right? Rear drive bias. So in that, then we have to decide, decide what type of powertrain you want to put into it. If you put the powertrain into it, you could just take whatever transmission that's out there on the market or whatever V6 engine that you could shoe, shoehorn transversal longitudinal. Yeah, those are those those are those solutions, but we're, we're Mazda, right? And we want to be different and we want to show that we're passionate about if we're going to go rear drive, let's go big, let's do it right. So. We committed on a straight six, and this is not just straight six, it's a family of straight sixes, right? Here in the US, we have two straight six uh, um, gasoline turbo engines in this platform, but there's a turbo diesel block that shares essentially the same architecture and everything in Europe, you know, and I won't talk about what else is potentially available, but the entire platform is designed for the straight six architecture. The only time that we don't use six cylinders is when we use a larger PHEV motor that's squeezed in, be in between the four-cylinder engine and our eight-speed transmission. Also, the other thing is, it's it, it's not so much oh we just try to make uh, you know more money by putting a different software into it. It's different customer values, right? One, the 280 horsepower engine is tuned for 87 AKI regular pump gas, right? You could put more, you could put high octane into it. It won't make more power. It is for that customer that didn't care about that additional 50, 60 horsepower and just wants to drive the car as it is and can appreciate, hey, I'm just gonna get pump gas. My wife doesn't care. I want the three-year-old, that's more important. But the Turbo S model, which is 340 horsepower, was tuned for a 91 AKI. And that's actually unique in itself because usually our powertrains are tuned for like North America style or European style. And European is at least 93 AKI, right? Or if not more. This is specifically for North America, and that's, that's the main thing, that these two gas engines are ours and ours only. Well, until somebody decides that they want it, but they were designed for us and tuned for us, right? So that's the big difference, boost and the amount of power that you can make with higher octane. But I do want to point out, even if you go to a lower octane on the high power car, torque's still the same. 
it's still 369. If you liked our gas engines from previous generations, their Skyactiv 2.5 non-turbos, that's what that 280 horsepower feels like. It's, it's turbocharged, but it's so linear, predictable, and consistent. Whereas the 340 horsepower, we try to let it stretch it a little bit towards the end, reward you a little bit more. You know, in, in trying to make a cool rear wheel drive platform using a straight six, you got a problem. You got a very long engine, right? And if you can either, you got two solutions. You got to hang it forward of the front axle, on top of the front axle, or try to shove it as far back as possible. Well, the thinking behind the RZ transmission, uh, which is the eight speed new transmission for the, for the rear drive orientation, is that we needed something as narrow and slender and long as we can. Because by doing that, we can push everything as far back into the chassis as possible, maintain the straight fr frame rails, straight SL, the SLA suspension up front, um, and not intrude into the footwell of the driver, right? As you know, a torque converter is about that big, you know, that thick. It's got a lot of rotational inertia. It's heavy, takes up a lot of space. So when we designed this transmission, and we did consider others, we said, no, let's do it the Skyactiv way. Let's do it in-house because it's going to give us full control of the software, the hardware, the packaging, and everything to make it fit this car or this platform. So we ended up with a wet clutch, wet launch clutch at the back of the transmission that's only this big, right? Much smaller, a lot less rotational inertia. And by putting it at the back of the eight-speed transmission, we made it freed up a lot of space in the front for either the 48-volt mild hybrid motor that helps you kind of get off the line and, and you smooth out torque and shifts and all that, or the full P-head motor that's up in front. Um, so those were our decisions for going to a torque converter. And when you ask about eight speed versus six speed, um, I think it's kind of worthwhile to point out that this is a evolutionary design based off the lessons that we learned from our Skyactiv six speed transmission on the transverse layout, right? So we decided to stay with a planetary, a planetary layout for all eight gears. So it's four planetary rings and stuff, you know, all the brakes associated with it. But the launch clutch is the launch clutch. Um, and you ask, well, a lot of people have asked us and say, well, why don't you have eight gears, you know, in, the, in our previous cars, right? Eight, more is better. I'm like, well, yes and no, okay? Uh, yes, you can overdrive a transmission and you could get a little more top-end fuel economy, but in our opinion as Mazda, every time you have to shift is an interruption in power in your connection to the driving experience or what your foot is doing. So we want to minimize interruptions. The reason why we went to an eight-speed transmission on this car is because when you take out the torque converter, you lose a little bit of that slippy torque multiplication effect. So what we had to do was actually take the gear spread on the FZ, the front wheel drive transmission, spread it to about 1.4 times what it was and have those lower gears cover that torque slip, torque modification effect that the torque converter had on the low end gears. So after one, two, into three, three, four, five, six, you still have the same consistent shifting rhythm and spacing that you had in our old six speed with just a little bit more overdrive on eight. So what are seven and eight doing? Seven and eight is kind of covering the range of six, five, six. One, two is so low that it far exceeds our original one. That driver sensation, that first tip in, if you're locked up and tight, and you don't have a slip, you don't have an interruption, when you felt that initial jerk, however minimal, that's telling your body, the vehicle's responding to me. And after that, it's just the extrapolation of, okay, car's responding, what is this G gain? Or what is this change in G? And is it matching what my intention is? After that, we can start downshifting and stuff. But we want to give you that initial response, that locked up response, like, okay, the car's responding, I'm gonna pull a little bit, not enough, okay, I'll give you another gear down. Okay, and then there's a lot of predictive strategies that we look like, how fast did they step? How deep did they step on me? That'll tell us how many gears, how many gears to jump past, or okay, he only wanted two down, or he only wanted one down, or hold them in eight. That's most, mostly my team's job to try to predict what your foot is trying to do. And the argument that, I mean, to be fair, ZF8 speed does not fit a front wheel drive platform, but mm -hmm. why not go with the ZF8 speed? If you drive a BMW product or not so much an FCA product, but if you drive an Audi product with that eight speed, it's hard to argue the cowl and that mm -hmm. gearbox is not almost perfect. 
It's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, there's, well, there, there's other competitors of, of the VAG family uh, that, that have even better things um, that we have considered and looked at and all that. But, you know, at that point, basically, you have a huge, massive torque converter. You're going to throw away the package. It's right? balancing packaging yeah. and performance. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. It's a very modest answer for that. No, I think, I think this, is, this is worth discussing. You could edit out, edit in, whatever. No, no, but, you know, like, I think this is one fundamental difference that Dave, what Dave works on, what I work on, Mazda is a little bit different. It's like we are not willing to sacrifice the base characteristic of the car when you fire it up so that it's kind of softened up or it's this and that. Like just Dave will not change steering modes. He will not, ch he doesn't like to change suspension cal just because the car, you know, has a certain physics to it, right? Um, we don't want to augment that. We don't want to tweak that in a way that kind of tricks you into thinking it's more or less than what it is. Similarly, in the vehicle side, when you get into a car in normal mode, it is a reflection of what Mazda should be, right? It's not comfort mode. Oh, you actually want to drive? Okay, put it into sport. Oh, and then sport plus. That's a little bit difference in philosophy. But, yeah, there's architecture differences and feel differences that um, you'll definitely feel. And those German brakes. <laughs>
the when you're cornering and the lower control arm bushing is deflecting, uh, that'll tow the front out a little bit, which stabilizes the car. If we put the steering rack in the back, for example, it would tow it in and that would make the car unstable. So therefore we'd have to put a bunch of roll steer in there to counteract that compliance steer. And then next thing you know, all everything, as you go over bumps, the car is steering and moving around and all of these little, very, very subtle move, movements that you don't notice consciously, you do notice subconsciously and you just get tired from all this movement and all this, this feeling that you can't really balance against. So all this very complicated hardware is there to make the car move in a very simple way. Yeah, so yeah, we this car has to carry six, seven, eight people, tow a trailer, do all these really practical things, be comfortable, uh, and and then secretly we want it to be a race car, right? That that's that's you know us, you know that's what we're really trying to do. If your philosophy for driving dynamics is what ours is, that the car should be linear and predictable and consistent, that lets you marry these two seemingly conflicting things, right? Uh, we don't necessarily want the car to be the softest thing possible that isolates you over all bumps, because if you do that, when you hit a slightly bigger bump than we anticipated, it all falls apart. Um, what we want the car to do is be completely predictable so that you know exactly what it's going to do. When you see something on the road ahead, boop, that's exactly what I expected it to do. When you turn it into a corner, it goes exactly where you expected it to go. And that is a philosophy that will translate across normal, daily, boring driving and driving fast. Um, if you're trying to just be comfortable and just drive gently and you give it gentle inputs, it moves gently. And if you're trying to be aggressive and go have some fun, it'll be fun. Uh, and that linearity gets you that. All modern all wheel drive systems, 99% of all -wheel, modern all wheel drive systems will drive two of the wheels all the time directly off the transmission. And then the other two wheels get driven by a clutch sort of on demand. Uh, that idea has been around for 20, 25 years. They used to be pretty dumb and reactive where you would spin the, the primary drive wheels and then it would engage a clutch and send power to the other, other end. And that was good for not getting stuck, getting out of a snowy situation, but it was terrible for driving dynamics because you'd lose control and then regain control. Um, as our control systems have gotten faster and faster and our precision of how, how exactly we control that clutch has gotten better and better, we can do much more sophisticated things with that same concept of driven wheels and secondary wheels. Um, so there's two different things that go on when you send torque to your secondary wheels. Uh, as you lock up that clutch, you make those front rear wheels go the same speed, which of course makes the car want to go straight. Um, and if any amount of preload on that clutch will create a little bit of, of damping when the car tries to rotate when it's yaws, right? So managing the trade-off of uh, torque split versus yaw damping um, started off as a, a, a managing a negative and has evolved to where the, the yaw damping control is actually one of the most useful tools that we have. It's now a positive point that we can use the all-wheel drive system to adjust the yaw damping of the vehicle. Um, so for example, the, the way we basically balance that is we've got three algorithms in, in the system that are, are looking at the, the all-wheel drive system from three different angles. There's one that's trying to predict uh, which tires are gonna have the most grip and send the torque there. And you can predict that pretty easily because the amount of traction you have is the, the mu of the surface times the normal force being pushed down on it. We don't know the mu of the surface, but we know how hard each tire is getting pushed down indirectly by knowing how heavy the car is and knowing where the, where the center of gravity is in the wheelbase. And just looking at the G-sensors, the, the weight shifts forward or back, uh, we can calculate the load on each tire and send torque where, where it's likely to have the most grip. Now, if we get in a split mu situation, we can't predict that. So we're also, of course, watching if one wheel suddenly starts going faster, we'll catch it within a, the fraction of a rotation and send torque to the other end and, and, and react to that if we need to. But both of those things are just looking at traction. And if we happen to be in a situation where we've got a, a, that torque transfer clutch locked up pretty hard and we're trying to turn, the car's just gonna understeer. So we have a third algorithm that looks at steering input and trims down whatever torque split we have at that moment and reduces it in proportion to the driver's steering input. So the car will carve a natural uh, arc through the corner. Um, and that last algorithm has turned out to be really powerful for us for tuning and dialing in the steering feedback to make sure that what the steering is telling you is matching what the vehicle is going to do. It's actually one of the last things that we tune uh, as we got everything else behaving the way we want it to and the steering, there's still you know, some subtle spots where the steering's not quite telling me the right thing. We'll tweak that all-wheel drive algorithm until it's, it's, it's communicating through your hands exactly how the car's gonna go around the corner.
So yeah, let, let's let's talk about active torque transfer and and and, and uh, torque vectoring and all that kind of stuff because that's stuff that we we don't do very intentionally. It's not like a cost savings thing. We could torque vector with the same hardware that we use for kinematic posture control. What we're trying to do is make the car carve through a corner in a certain very predictable natural way where the g-forces and the yaw motions that you feel come from the front tires turning building up load pitching the car forward you know, the, the the sequence of load transfer through this the chassis is consistent and predictable and it makes it easy for you to control the car there are cars that have uh torque vectoring systems where you'll go into a corner you'll do a certain thing you'll reach the limit and so suddenly some yaw comes out of nowhere and it does more I don't personally mind that. I think that's fun, but I'm a rally driver, right? I like, you, know, you, can, you can expand the envelope beyond what you expect it to do. But what we're after is completely predictable behavior. So we want to get that extra margin by making the original existing load path and, uh, through the suspension make that work better. So one of the things we do is the, the kinematic posture control where we're keeping the rear suspension in the middle of its stroke uh, through the higher G uh, um, corners. So what that's doing is it's looking at the difference in wheel speed between the inside and outside rear tires and and it's figuring out how tight a corner you're going through uh, by by that uh, and then it's dragging the inside brake just a touch if we drag the inside brake a lot we get torque factoring uh, and we increase a, a, introduce a yaw moment but we're not dragging it enough to do that you actually you know watch the data with and without the brake and there's no change in the yaw moment but what we're doing is just enough to pull, pull down on the rear suspension uh, because we have anti-dive geometry that, that helps prevent dive. That same geometry just pulls the inside rear down a little bit. And that keeps the suspension in its more neutral uh, posture through the corner, reduces body roll a touch. Um, but mostly what it's doing is making the car behave more predictably through the corner. Your priority isn't necessarily the most nimble feeling car, but it's the most linear feeling car. Right, the most nimble feeling car is a synonym for the most twitchy feeling car. Those, those are two sides of the same coin. What we want is, is the car that does exactly what you're asking of. So we intentionally have relatively slow steering because we need resolution so the driver can make mid-corner inputs and they're not, they're not twitchy. If you have a, there's a, there's a trend in a lot of cars these days have really fast steering racks because electric power steering sort of opens up these possibilities. But if you have a really fast steering ratio, to keep it from being twitchy, you have to add a lot of damping to the software so that, so that you don't, a little quick input doesn't translate through to the tires. That damping blocks any feedback from the tires. Um, so what you're feeling through your hands is not what the tires are doing, it's the damping algorithm that you're feeling. Uh, and we wanna run as little damping as we possibly can so you have a chance to understand what the tire is doing and that's what tells you where the car is going to go. Um, if we run the, the low damping setting that we have on our steering with a quick 13 to one steering rack, then when you sneeze, you're gonna end up in a ditch, right? So that's, that's why we stick to a more traditional slower steering rack to give you adjustability and predictability through a corner. Is it Takumi time, Mark? Yeah, give it to me, and I need boost mode, too. I put it in the sport. Put it past the detent for boost mode. I've been boosted. Four cylinders, PHEV. We're in the model that I think most people are going to buy because of the fuel economy benefits. This is not the inline six, though I've driven essentially every, every iteration of this car, Turbo S, regular in line six and now this PHEV, I'm gonna put it back into And why are we in normal. the PHEV now, Jack? Because our Turbo S pre-production press car that we got a couple weeks ago wasn't right. And during the launch program, I focused on shooting interviews with everyone who made this car. So hopefully by the time you get to this section of the video, if you've heard from all the Takumis themselves and the Takumis dogs and everyone associated with this car at this point, they're, they're house cleaners. Yeah, <laughs> everybody, their personal masseuse. Like we, I have to put this out there because we're a Mazda sympathizer uh, and uh, I really like the brand. It's a brand that doesn't have a lot of resources and maximizes everything that they do. And, you know, there's a lot of excuses that you can make for a team that works as hard as they can where they don't have 500 people to, to work on one thing. Yeah, they're not a Toyota. 
They're not a Toyota, they're not a Ford, they're not a GM. They consistently churn out the best thing that they can do with the resources, and you know I'm already setting this up. You to make made it. a lot of excuses so far. <laughs> All right, so CX90, other... everyone's asked me, and we've heard yeah. from everybody, how does this thing drive? What do you think about it? Uh, so I don't have as much time in it as you. I've driven the Turbo S in this. And one of the reasons why, as you already stated, I couldn't release a video on the Turbo S because I wasn't particularly sure that there wasn't something wrong with it. From the cross traffic alert system malfunctioning, thinking there were cars always there when there's nobody around. Which even it still on does in this PHEV. Uh, so the software weirdness, uh, there's drivetrain growl when you turn and accelerate, there was a vibration through the entire car that felt like something was loose or vibrating. Uh, and then, you know, there, there was other things. So I'm just, I gave it a pass and the ride quality was, I don't know what was going on with it, but we sent it back and sent it to the dealer to see what was up. So this car is the replacement for it. And I will say, let's start with the body control and handling. And I know Dave is going to be mad because we're not on some canyon road with this thing, but this is a reality of what people but are going to drive. But I did drive the Turbo S in San Francisco on his drive road. Okay, and how was it? It's a very uniquely Mazda product. <laughs> okay. What I mean by that is they care more about linearity of inputs and that everything feels as progressive and as whatever their acronym is, horse and rider as one as possible. Or most of Jin Bai Yitai. Oh, thank you. Jin Bai Yitai and the Sichuan S. They care more about their principles than necessarily building a car that is what their buyers are looking for. Typically, people in this segment, like the minivan driver in front of us, are looking for something soft, mm -hmm. something isolated, and something that feels nimble. Because the steering is so slow in this car, and yes, you can make mid-corner corrections, which Dave talked about, you know, most people don't give a shit, right? They want it to feel fast in the front end. And the fact that you have to go, like, you know, you have to give it almost a full lock of turn to get into a basic corner. The steering feels very slow. Yes, it's linear-ish and it's easy to make adjustments, but the front end doesn't feel fast because they've prioritized minimal head bob. And you know, the worst case examples like the Grand Highlander or the Telluride, you do a lot of secondary motions. Mm -hmm. This car, they didn't want to have that problem at all. So the, the ride is stiff. It really is shockingly stiff for a big three-row SUV. Is it punishing? No, but we have a Crosstrek at the same time as this thing, brand new Crosstrek. And that thing rides better than this does, which is kind yeah, of surprising. I, I will say that I, it is, with all due respect, that philosophy does not work on this. It, it does not work. It's not the right product to have that type of DNA baked in. And I think it's one of those where you have to swallow your pride and realize that this needs to be it needs a different philosophy in suspension tuning and ride control. The body control is good, but as soon as you get on a bumpy road, like out here in the Midwest, Michigan, and Illinois, wherever you hit those small, like, sudden impacts, the high-frequency, like, impact off this car is really, really jarring. It remind the only other SUV, to me, that rides equally, or if not worse, and a lot of it is body structure, was the XC90. That car felt like the front and the rear end weren't screwed together completely. It felt like there was just so much shock wave through the body. This does a better job isolating you out, but it also has a lot of like high frequency impacts that go through your body. And it, it doesn't feel like what it should be doing is isolating all of that out for a car like this. You shouldn't be feeling it. You should be floating more and it doesn't. Uh, this, the counterpoint is, is yes, when you get it into the twistier roads. It, it handles it, great. The body control is good. You don't float around, but that's like, for most people, 5%. The other 95% is that's like... probably like 1% in a right, three right. row that you're going to use for your family. Yeah, you, you want to be isolated out, and it, you're just not enough in here. And I think it's a big problem, and probably you have the same problem that Toyota did with the Grand Highlander when you deal with one shock damping profile. You don't have a dual valve design shock. You don't have adaptive dampers where you can you can play with the software part of it. You can go soft or you can go firm. So you're stuck with this one and they chose it to, to have this better body control at the sacrifice of overall comfort. I, I don't the know. The interior and exterior of this car are beautiful. I think it's a very pretty car. I like the fact that they've gone to rear wheel drive architecture, but I you don't my, notice it. 
you can't tell. I mean, honestly, well, like when you're normally driving, 95 percent of the time. My big issue with this is, I've spent just a marginal amount of time in two trim levels and I feel like I'm thinking way more about it than I should be I feel like there's I should instantly just have a sense like a lot of other cars that oh the ride quality bones like a new pilot when you get a new pilot yes it handles well it rides soft it does all the three row SUV things and then when I drive it the drivetrain disappears into the background which in the two cars that we drove it doesn't on this it does weird things jerking and like lift off like almost knock or shudder sometimes Um, there's weird programming things that the drivetrains do and the inline six and this um, just hesitation or bucking. I mean, there's so many little things here that I don't feel like they have completely sorted out yet that um, it's it's hard because I had high expectations. Like, it could be the other thing. You know, rear wheel drive architecture, uh, new generation, inline six, you hear all these things, like great interior, beautiful exterior for a crossover SUV. And then you get in here and you're like, man, they need another like four or five years of development to like sort it. I'm not saying that in a bad way, but it just, it doesn't align with like some of the other brands where they have all these little things sorted out. They don't, it doesn't feel like that here. Let's talk about drivetrain. So the inline six, it is very smooth. And for the class of car it competes in, both in the Let's call it in the 40,000s to the mid 50s. It does a good job, right? It has more character than, say, like the MDX V6. Yeah. Is it as refined as like the B58? No, it's not, but it's at a different price point. The hybrid setup in this car does return decent fuel economy. Yeah. You're getting 30 miles per gallon, which is really good in a three row. Right. And when you're moving, you don't really notice the hybrid tendencies of this. You don't really think about the fact that it's got a four popper versus a six or the handoff between electric and gas. Yeah, that's really smooth, actually. But when you are in creeping in traffic in that 1% to 2% throttle application, you feel it. You feel yeah. it in a way that you don't feel it in the Toyota products. Again, that comes from the fact that they've been doing hybrids yeah. for a billion years. And the dry, and the gearboxes, they're really smooth when you're again, moving. But when you creep in traffic, or every so often, it kind of yeah, reminds the me of the lift off. Yes. You know, just the the subtle inputs, the subtleties of like coming, rolling, or getting started, or just kind of like the like you said, like the slower traffic, it it, it doesn't go disappear like a lot of the other competitors. It doesn't disappear into the background. It's constantly doing things, and the, this is one of the few cars or SUVs or trucks, whatever you want to call it that I feel like I need an extended period of time driving this, like not just a week, I'd probably need a month before some of this just falls away and it becomes normal to me. But the the challenging part of that for me is that's not how most customers are gonna be. If you're not a Mazda fanatic, you're, you're gonna get in, you're gonna love it if you love Mazdas, but if you're a normal person and you get into this compared to like a Toyota and you have a one day test drive, other than the looks and the interior wowing you, if you care about some of these other drivability things, it might it might set up some red flags. I, funnily enough, I had a conversation with a lot of the engineers off camera about, you know, they, they asked me genuinely what I thought. And I think one of the issues that they're going to have is their uniquely Mazda philosophy of everything's linear, no gimmicks. The modern car buyer doesn't give a shit. They care about gimmicks, right? right. Yeah. When they, the reason why drive modes exist in cars is so you can wow a customer with, look, it can go ultra stiff and it can go ultra soft. Are either of those good? Who cares? The consumer doesn't know any better. Steering, is it linear? Most of the time, steering needs to be fast in cars. Not because it's better, but because it gives the illusion of being at nimble. Like a brand new BMW X5, X3. Almost every car with a uh, adaptive rack, you know, a variable rate rack, you know, where you get that quickness, this doesn't have it. And that's why I said, like, this philosophy, what they're trying to do here just really doesn't work for this. And it's not that their philosophy is wrong. It's just this requires a different approach that I don't think they have for this and i don't know if it's better or worse i really i don't want to judge it based on that because customers could like it but i you know i need to go back and really look at this like and nitpick certain things and look at the pros and the cons and come back to this car again and i hate to say it but it's one of those i really need to revisit yep with that mark i think it's time for us to wrap up this incredibly long video thanks jack beeps god Final thoughts on the CX-90. Given the reshoots, the amount of time thinking about this, and of course, driving the PHEV, and of course, the inline six version, we were left 
feeling a bit mixed. After driving almost all of the three row competition from the Pilot to the MDX, the MDX Type S, the X7, the Audi equivalents, you know, there's a lot of competition out there now. And I think what they're trying to do is find some middle ground between the luxury products and the commodity products and find this real sweet spot where they're trying to focus on driving enjoyment and driving linearity. And of course, offering you some luxury appointments while ma not making it feel so cookie cutter. And in this chase to do it, I, unfortunately, I think some of the other brands have outpaced them in their own game. When you drive the Pilot, despite it being a front wheel drive architecture with a torque vectoring rear, it just feels softer. It feels like it rides better most of the time. It feels more nimble under that 70% driving threshold. The MDX is very similar to that. And you look at things like the Telluride and the Palisade, which are ancient at this point, they always ride softer, but they are horrible to drive but above 50%. But I think the main takeaway is, is if you're buying a three row, most of the three row expectations, like the Highlanders, the Grand Highlanders, is that they are really soft. They don't need to be great driving because you're never doing that. You're hauling, you're, you're towing, you're putting people in it. So I feel like a lot of the, the tuning of this car sacrifices some of the things that three row people are going to care about in the chase of you know maybe making it more engaging to drive and it's really still not that engaging to drive uh and that was the big thing some of the drivetrain calibration was also a little bit off the the inline six version the performance version that we drove or the turbo s uh there was more driveline shutter in that thing than i've ever felt in a modern car it felt like there was a lot of vibration either from the differential or the drive shaft. There was just a lot of vibration that came from the engine at certain RPM that wasn't isolated out. That's why we thought there was a problem. The PHEV definitely smoothed things out, um, but there's still strangeness in transmission tuning and calibration where there's the switchover point where you have electric assist to transmission, like gear hunting sometimes. It's not perfectly smooth. And I think that's where, of course, in a first generation product, despite as much work as you can put into it, there's still some things to be sorted out there. And philosophically, you can't argue with Mazda. This is what they want to do. This is what's made them different from everybody else. That the driving part, the connectedness part, I just think as a three row SUV, this is not the vehicle that really needs a lot of that. And I think in some cases it's worse for trying to inject some of that in. And I know that's bad but I feel like some of the other brands have figured out how to do it better, where as a everyday vehicle, like the CX-9 was, I think the CX-9 even did a better job than the CX-90 did at trying to make it that cruiser, that smooth cruiser, um, easier to drive. It felt softer most of the time, but anyway, you know, this to me is probably one of the more interesting vehicles I've ever driven in this price range. And it's a testament to them as engineers and designers are really not trying to do the same thing. We complain about this all the time. Every brand's trying to copy and paste and do, their, do the same thing, chase popularity, and Mazda is just trying to do their own thing. Now, whether or not that's gonna resonate with customers, I don't know, and I, I don't even wanna say, but when you look at the, the vehicle overall, it is definitely a special experience, and I will give them that. It's something that you wanna get in, and if you're looking for that different three row that's not the same thing you're really going to appreciate what they did and I, jack and i both really do love that about the cx90 i can't wait for their other products on this platform to see how they scale it out how they make improvements and we'll cover it then thanks for watching see you next video